Okay, so um, we were talking last time about information spaces, which we're going to finish uh, today. Uh, HCI is all about user interfaces. User interfaces give a view onto an information space. So in lecture nine, we've been talking about what is an information space, what do you find in an information space, and how, you do, how do you decide on the structure of an information space, which you are going to be doing in deliverable 7, 8, 9, 10, and onward from there. Once you've created this information space, once you've created your ASL educational system, it's populated by conceptual objects like gesture and finger and bone, and you're going to start to add in new conceptual objects like lesson and lesson plan and tutorial and do-over and points and uh, high scoreboards and so on. How are you going to create the visualizations that will give your ASL learner a view into that space? Your users probably don't care about XYZ of bases and tips of bones, but they do care about fingers and hands and gestures and lessons and lesson plans and so on. Right? We're going to hopefully get through uh, lecture 10 as well today, which is once you have this information space, and you're creating user interfaces, again, you're creating it with a particular goal in mind, which is making it easy for your users to understand the structure of that space and move through that space. What does it mean to navigate through an information space? Okay, hopefully if we finish all that today, we will start with a fresh theme uh, on Monday, which is uh, a crash course in four lectures on cognitive psychology, right? We've been talking mostly about uh, the computer part of human-computer interaction. In lecture uh, 11, 12, 13, to 14, we'll focus on the human part of human-computer interaction. Okay, any qu other questions about deliverable 6? No? And we're on to deliverable 7 now, where you're adding state to your system. Yes? You mentioned the use of high game. Would yes. be a good time to try to switch over to that? Or now would be looking a... into Matplotlib, at least for videos, and yeah. it was looking a little Yes, uh, it's, it's very hard to include videos into Matplotlib, so if you want to go that route, you might want to use uh, Pygame. Um, some other things uh, that you might want to use is, um, uh, is to use, if you're feeling ambitious, you can use pipes. So there's a, um, there's a Python, uh, Python package out there. It's not called Pipes. I forget what it's called. But if you Google pipe, Google Python Pipes, you'll find it. So your main program, with its infinite loop, can actually start up a separate executable or a second Python program, which is a Python program that just opens a window, plays a video, and closes again. So through Pipes, you can... From your main program, start up another program and communicate to it, send information back and forth across a pipe. You might not even need to do that. That's one way to go if you want to sort of keep all the matplotlib functionality you've developed and just sort of spin off a parallel process that will draw something or show a video to the screen and then end. That's one, one direction. The other direction is to just push forward with matplotlib, and if you do, yeah, I would shy away from videos and try and do things with uh, images or maybe animated GIFs. Third option is, again, to set aside matplotlib and redo stuff in Pygame. Pygame draws in 2D, though, not 3D. So if you, I would suggest if you want to, you know, sort of dip your foot in the pool and see if that's the direction you want to go, create a new empty... Pygame, uh, a new empty Python program, import Pygame, grab a frame of leap motion data, and try just drawing that frame using Pygame. So sort of go back to deliverable 2 and see if you can draw a wireframe. And if it looks intuitive, then maybe you want to switch over to, to Pygame. It's up to you. It doesn't, doesn't matter to us. All right? OK. All right, so information spaces. So we were talking about user interfaces, which are different views onto an information space, a little bit of the history of where user, faces, user interfaces were and where they're going, perhaps. And we got into an information space, which has this underlying conceptual structure. It's pretty abstract. 
Some of that underlying conceptual structure you're going to want to make visible to your users and other parts not, right? So how much of the hierarchical data that you're grabbing from Leap Motion are you going to want to advertise to your, your users? Okay. So we got last time to this idea of, we ended last time by talking about constructing an ontology, right? You're, think, you're going to start to think now about your ASL educational system. What are the things that are going to exist, right? What are those conceptual objects? Once you decide on them, you might sit down and actually start to make some classes or start to cr add them to your, your code. Then, as your user interacts with the system, they're going to start to create a taxonomy, right? So how many lessons have they completed, how many have they attempted, and so on. So ontologies are different from taxonomies. We all have the same ontology running on our laptops, which is this thing called an operating system, which is mostly made up of files and folders. We all have the same ontology, but we all have different taxonomies. We organize our files and folders differently. Most of you are going to have pretty much the same ontology for your ASL system. You're all going to sort of have lessons and lesson plans and tutorials, but you might also have little slight differences in your ontologies. Some of you may have points, some of you may not. Some of the points may mean different things in different systems. How free is your user to take that ontology and construct a taxonomy, right? That they, they build up a lesson plan themselves, or is it something that's forced, forced on them? Okay, so just a little bit about the difference between ontology and taxonomy. Epistemology is the philosophical study of how this actually occurs. Why did you construct a particular ontology in a certain way? All right, I just wanted to touch on that, but we're not going to spend any more time talking about epistemology. Okay, so in the rest of Lecture 9 now, we're going to look at different characteristics of an information space, and we're going to make choices about these characteristics. How big is the space? What is its structure? Um, what does distance and direction mean in that space? So starting to get into the navigation part of it. And as, we're, as usual in HCI, when we're thinking about these different characteristics of our information space, we want to keep in mind who our users are and what they want to do with our system, right? You're going to have a user who is trying to learn the 10 digits of ASL. As you start to make des design decisions about your own ontology and taxonomy in your system, you want to make those decisions based on your understanding <coughs> of your user's goals. Okay, so last time we started to talk about one aspect of information spaces, which is its resolution, right? Is it coarse-grained or fine-grained? So an operating system is kind of very coarse-grained that there's two main objects, files and folders, right? In the history of operating systems, that hasn't changed, right? Operating systems have, have come and gone, but all of them have supported this basic idea of files and, and folders. So you're trying to think about the volatility of your system. How is the system going to change from version 1, 2, 3, and 4? If it's very volatile, meaning your system is going to be adapted for lots of different functions and lots of different users, you might want to try and decide uh, on a coarse-grained ontology, right? So operating systems have changed quite a bit, so let's keep things simple. The one thing that's probably not going to change at least anytime soon, is this idea of files and, and folders. If, on the other hand, we have an idea for an information space, and that's it. It's going to have this function. We're going to sort of lock it in. It's a very specific application. Then maybe we want to have a fine-grained ontology. We can clearly define a large number of conceptual objects so that any one conceptual object is pretty simple. Right? So how, what is the rate of change in terms of functionality of the system, and how does that influence back to our thinking about the structure of this information space? Okay. Uh, again, decisions about coarse grain or fine grain now makes us think differently about how we're going to do search in this, this system. Right. So if we create uh, if we create a coarse grained ontology, we have relatively a few number of classes or different kinds of conceptual objects, but any one object is pretty complicated, right? There's going to be a lot of things that describe the detail of that object. So if we have few relatively complex objects, 
We better make sure that we supply some search functionality that allows the user to find something inside that, that space. Right? So if you decide on a coarse-grained ontology for your, um, for your ASL educational system, you decide there's a thing called a lesson, one big lesson, and your user is working their way through that lesson. They should have some ability to move about inside that lesson or when they come back to the system, start back where they started from and continue forward. Right? If, on the other hand, you decide on a fine-grained uh, ontology, there's going, to be, uh, there's going to be a syllabus, and in the syllabus are multiple themes, and in each theme is a different lesson, and each lesson is broken up into a number of steps, and so on and so forth. You want to make sure that people are able to search across the objects, right, across the hierarchy. So a simple example would be if you go to a website that has relatively few pages but very long pages, most of your users are going to be searching for text inside the page. If you've got lots and lots of pages, then obviously you're going to need to supply some search functionality to search across pages. We've touched on this already towards the beginning of the class. So the information space itself has these conceptual objects. And you may decide to create perceptual objects that correspond to the conceptual objects. So in your system so far, there is a perceptual object called a line segment. And that line segment corresponds to the conceptual object called bone, right? The very close correlation there. There is no perceptual object uh, for the actual x, y, and z position, right? It's implied by the lines, but it's not actually in there. OK. Um, there is a conceptual object in your ontology right now called a frame. Does that have a perceptual object associated with it? Sorry? So it's a perceptual object, which means the user is perceiving it. A perceptual object is anything they see on the screen or hear, anything that your users can perceive when they interact with your system. So there's this conceptual object called a bone. And there is an object that, that corresponds to that that the users can perceive, that they can see, a line, line segment. What about frame? That's a different conceptual object. Is there a perceptual object associated with that? The, the, right, the cube, right, inside which the wire frame is drawn. Your users are going to realize that it's an animation, right? And hopefully it's relatively real time with them moving their hand. Anyone who looks at a computer screen is probably already familiar with animations, and everybody knows that an animation is made up of these things called frames, right? It might not be at the top of their mind, but they're kind of aware that there's this animation in a bunch of frames. It's not as immediately obvious as the line segment, but it's there, right? There's another conceptual object called a controller, which is what you're pulling the frames out of, right? That's another conceptual object in this particular information space. Is there a perceptual object associated with that? Maybe the device itself you can think of as the, the controller, but, but not really, right? It's, it's just not, not there. There is a physical object, obviously, which is the leap motion device. And hopefully your users can understand that what they're seeing on the screen, the perceptual objects, and the underlying conceptual objects there, the bone or the parts of the hand that are being pulled out by this device, are, are connected. Right? So now you, have, you already have an information space which is made up of physical objects, the device, the, phys the user's hand itself, perceptual objects, so the animation, the frames that make up the animation, animation the line segments inside each frame, perceptual objects, and at the bottom of it all, the conceptual objects, right? the actual classes and objects in your, in your code. Okay, so so far, hopefully, we've been helping you to make a good match between those things, right? When you now start to add a new conceptual object called a lesson, what is the perceptual object that someone is going to see that lets them know that there's this thing called a lesson in the system? 
And remember that we're assuming that your users don't speak English, so you can't write lesson on the screen. How are they going to know? What things might you do to advertise the fact that there's a series of lessons? So you could do an icon for the different numbers. You could. Absolutely, right? So we could have 10 icons on the screen. And once the user starts to realize that they're learning digits, without any text, they should be able to infer this one is zero because I'm trying to learn zero now. And maybe the next one is going to be one, two, three, four, and so on, right? So without actually saying it, they might see that there are 10 lessons. Actually, they've learned there's an additional conceptual object called a digit or a gesture. And they'll probably infer that if there's 10 of them, those 10 perceptual objects, those 10 icons, correspond to 10 lessons. And those lessons help you learn one of the 10 digits, right? That would be a good... Uh, that would be a good correspondence between perceptual objects and conceptual objects. Right? Seems obvious now that we've said it, but it's not always obvious when you sit down to do this. Often there's a mismatch between perceptual objects and conceptual objects. So let's imagine that I'm trying to uh, visualize or communicate some network structure, and I have a conceptual object, which is a graph, a bunch of nodes and edges connected together. They're pretty tightly connected, so it's kind of all one object, but I'm storing different parts of that graph in different perceptual objects. It's not a very good match between the underlying conceptual object, which is this graph, and a bunch of these perceptual objects. Can you think of examples from applications you've worked with where there was a bad alignment between the conceptual objects and the perceptual objects? Every single dictionary software I've ever used. Oh, <laughs> tell us about that. How so? never really understand what anything in there is going to be doing because what you perceive it's I guess that would be more affordability though. Okay. Affordance. Okay. You never really understand how it's actually going to work just by looking at it. You have no idea. You have to be trained on it extensively. You and why, right? It should hopefully that it should be pretty intuitive, and you should be able to learn something by seeing immediately by looking at the screen. There's this general structure to this application which gives a window onto something, right? Conveniently, university, universities are very hierarchical places, right? You've got the university, colleges, departments, classes, professors, students, TAs, and so on. For some reason, university software is terrible, right? Luckily, the system for which a lot of HR software and other support software for universities is developed is for a very hierarchical system but that's never very clearly reflected in a lot of the support software I've seen, right? If I were to redo PeopleSoft or the CATS reports or whatever it is that you happen to use, there'd be one thing on the screen, right? UVM, you click on it and it breaks into the seven colleges. You click on one of those, it, you know, you could use the underlying conceptual structure of the university and tie those hierarchical units to independent perceptual objects, which would allow anyone to navigate through the system and find what they're they're looking for. Just out of curiosity, I understand why in veterinary software um, there isn't really that level of attention to the user interface. But why is it in something like the education system, where I know it's not like a super profitable system, but it's more so than veterinary medicine? Like, why is it, you know? The politics, I guess? I well, okay, so this could devolve into a very long yes, conversation. I, I will give you my view as a faculty member. The people that decide which software to purchase for the university haven't taken my class yet. That's, that's why. That's the last user interface and usability. That's the last thing on the list that, that matters. Right? You can probably imagine what are the more important properties of the, of the system. Okay. Okay. Topology. So we've decided on the basic conceptual objects that make up our information space. Now we can start to think about the relationships between these things. So topology is a term from math which tells you something about how you can get from point A to point B. So the moment we start talking about topology, we're already starting to talk about navigation, right? <coughs> so if we just think about the conceptual objects for a minute, what are the different categories and how do they relate to one another? So animal, human, rock, 
planet. Let's take four conceptual objects. If we were to put it to a vote, hopefully most of us would agree that animal and human are somehow closer to one another than either is to, uh, or sorry, that animal and human are closer to one another than animal or planet are, right? We're all thinking about other conceptual objects to compute that conceptual distance between these things. Right? And again, we want to have a good match between the conceptual structure of our system and the perceptual structure of our system. So hopefully different lessons are close to one another and different users of your system are close to one another perceptually, however you're going to show that in your system, but there's more distance between the lessons, plural, and the users, plural, right? Lesson, uh, uh, lesson zero and lesson two are maybe further apart than lesson zero and lesson one, and lesson one and lesson two, right? All of that kind of stuff is going to help your user navigate through, through the system. If they can see that, you're already advertising that you discourage going from lesson zero to lesson nine. You should pro if you finish lesson zero, go to the next lesson that's close to lesson zero. What is that, right? What do we mean by that conceptually? And then build that in perceptually. Okay, how to move, but, and again, we might draw intuition between, from the physical world, right? We all have lots of experience with the physical world. You want to make sure that you're supporting those expectations in your system. Generally speaking, if two places are closer to one another, they're easier to get from one to the other, and it takes less time. That's just true in the physical world. Make sure that your information space, which isn't a physical system, also supports that, that intuition. Okay, I'll show you an example of topology uh, in a moment. For those of you that take my evolutionary robotics class uh, in the spring, or those of you that have taken it, um, all of the lesson material is hosted in Reddit, and it's called Ludobots. You can go and have a look. So one of the things that I know that my students need to figure out when they come to the online course is what is the order in which they should complete the lessons that you can find on the online course. If you actually take my class, I will tell you, but if you're a random user out on the web and you find this course and I'm not there, it should be pretty, pretty clear. So we developed, uh, we developed this is Ludobots. Uh, here, we developed this visualization called the course tree, which you can see here. And again, I'm hiding the legend here from you, so you, there's no text to help you. Tell me about the structure of the lessons in Ludobots. If you've already taken the class, no cheating. Yep. Do you have like a core? Set of classes to teach with their own sub, subclasses? Exactly, right? So we chose a tree as the underlying perceptual object. We could have chosen uh, a tree map or a hierarchy or a graph or a list of lists. We chose a tree because, again, I wanted to try and show at a, at a glance that there is a core project. This is actually the landing page here for Ludobots, and this is the first. Uh, programming project, once you complete that one, that's the next one. And from some of these points along the spine of the course, there are other branches that you can go and pursue to learn other things that are related but somewhat tangential to the main lessons of uh, the evolutionary robotics class. One of these branches is actually the, lesson, the programming projects from this class. Um, we just never finished the, the branch. So you can actually follow the projects part of the way in, in Ludobots as well. Okay, let's play the same game we played in Gapminder. What do you think the size of the circles represent? Importance. Importance, close. This is me testing to make sure that we, create, we actually did create an intuitive visualization. <coughs> So in yep, time to, learn. time to learn. Another good guess. That's not what it is. So we host this course in uh, in Reddit. So you can go and complete the programming project. 
like this class, upload images or videos somewhere else, and then post a link in the subreddit that points to your solutions. So every time a user submits uh, a submission here, that submission, which is another conceptual object, gets associated with that class or that lesson. Okay, after having told you that hint, how many have been submitted? How many have been submitted, right? So the size tells me to glance how many people have at least attempted a submission to that to that project, right? Not whether they were correct or not, just how many. The submissions are also on here. What are they? The little red dots, right? Each one, one of those little red dots is, is a submission. Okay, maybe hard to see here, but there are also numbers embedded in the circles, and you can search for those numbers down here, so you can also see in a different way all of the different programming projects that you can attempt just in a flat list. Okay, so that was our attempt to try and advertise the topology of the information space for our online class. Our online class is made up of a whole bunch of projects and submissions and some other conceptual objects. We wanted to try and show in a glance what's the topology, right? If you're working on this project, where can you go from here? Most students choose to follow the primary path, but how do they know what the primary path is, right? They can go and look at the course tree. They can follow the path that most other students have attempted, right? That's probably a good, a good strategy or they can follow one of these side branches and go off and try, try something else. Okay, so topology is basically just sort of what is connected to what. Now we get into a little bit more detail like distance. So what actually does it mean for two conceptual objects to be further or closer to one another in this, this information space, right? So, what does it actually, how do we define distance here? There's some obvious ones, like the number of clicks it takes to get from point A to point B, the amount of time it takes the user to get from point A to point B. What else? Think about your growing ASL educational system. Your users are going to be trying to learn ASL digits in there. What kind of distance might be important for, for them in that case? So we're talking about an information space now, so I'm talking about distance in the information space, right? So a user who's trying to uh, complete project three in my online class, they can look at the course tree and see that lesson six, not surprisingly, is three lessons away, which they can get to by clicking three times, lesson four, five, six. That's one obvious way of measuring distance in an online class. What else might be important? Maybe the sequencing of like which digits they start with? Could be. That, that could be important. Let's say a user is taking my online class or is using your system. They've just learned uh, one of the digits and they now see that the lesson branches. They can either follow branch A or branch B, right? And they might want to decide which of these two branches to follow. In my online course, they can see through the visualization how many users have attempted, have gone down this path or that path. So what might that imply about the distance of those two paths? So I can see that there's two next lessons that I could take. I've, I've finished this lesson. I could go to, towards that lesson or I could head towards that lesson. I can click and just go to those lessons, so that distance isn't really that important to me, given what I'm trying to do. What other distance metric might be important to that learner, given what they're trying to do? The number of clicks doesn't, it's not, it doesn't matter here. How far away is this lesson from the current lesson? How would we define that? Like the level of difficulty? 
level of difficulty, right? So I may be deciding I've only got an hour more that I want to spend on this with this system. Do I have time to get to that lesson or that one? Maybe one or both is too far away, but what does far away mean, right? This is something we want to try and advertise to the user. The number of, number of jumps to get to that lesson? Number of jumps, right? So, so what is a jump here, like right? Number, you, number of, like, if you want to go to lesson six and you're yep. lesson two, yep. that's three, four, five, six. Jumps, exactly. So we can, div so the number of jumps to get there, if we, if we enumerate our lessons, is clear. If I'm on lesson two and I can see lesson six out there, I know it's four jumps. But if jumps are, key, are mouse clicks, I don't care. That's not important, right? I can click forward to lesson six and click back to lesson two. That's not the distance metric that I'm going to be interested in. It's probably something to do with level of difficulty. But what does that mean? Sorry. Can I do it just by, like, by coloring, um, using some sort of a color chart, so you green would be easy, because I feel like that's kind of universal. So exactly, we could use color, so we could use these perceptual objects to advertise difficulty, but we still haven't quantified difficulty here. Maybe the number of steps, right? So you could take the actual numbering from the programming projects in the online course, right? So that lesson has 72 steps, and that one has 14. That one is closer to me than that one, right? So the number of steps that make up the next lesson, that might be a good indicator of distance. What else might be important? How much knowledge is needed before you start the next uh, absolutely, right? How much knowledge is needed, but again, how do we quantify that? Uh, the amount of overlap, right? So if I've completed lesson I, 90% of the material is overlapping with lesson J, but only 10% of the material overlaps lesson K. I've only got an hour left to play around with this thing. I'm going to go do J, right? There's only 10% new stuff. I need to learn there, right? So difficulty, number of steps, amount of overlap. Now these are all things that you as the designer might have to compute beforehand, which is a lot of work. Could we turn this over to our users? Could you sort of crowdsource this? Could you in real time keep updating the distances between pairs of lessons based on what the users are doing? And if so, what would it be? What would you measure from your users to compute or keep recomputing distances between pairs of lessons? Can you just do the amount of time that it takes them to complete? The amount of time it takes them to complete. One of the really interesting things, for us at least, as the designers of this course, is not just how many submissions there are, but someone who completed this lesson, how long did it take on average for them to then, if ever, to complete the next one? For, we found empirically that's the best metric, right? Well, the, the best metric is did they ever come back, right? Maybe we killed them on lesson, lesson two, right? What's the spread of times from one lesson to the next? Two users, it took them 10 minutes. Everyone else, it took three weeks, right? That's the kind of distance metric that matters for this information space because of packed analysis what our users are trying to do, right? Their activity is to try and learn. So the number of clicks it takes to get from one lesson to the next is irrelevant. It's the time it takes them to learn or complete one step before going on to the, the next. In a different information space that had the same structure, now maybe key, the number of key clicks is the more important distance metric, and the time that they go from one to the next is not as important. And then advertising that back to the, the users. So I could redraw this picture where the length of the lines shows the amount of time it takes users to get from one to the next. Here the, the length of the lines is just arbitrary, but we could actually start to use that conceptual information, distance between two lessons, and turn it into a perceptual object, longer or shorter lines. If we did that, and you were a learner that came to the course, you might not even realize that that's happening, 
But even though you don't realize it, you may be basing your decisions about whether to go left or right based on that. You may not even realize that you've, it's taken you a long time to go from this one to one that's very far away. So you intuitively look at the course tree and decide to go for the nearer branch rather than the longer branch. Right? Often when HCI designers do their job well, the users aren't aware of it. Okay. So that's distance, how far apart things are. What about direction? Right? So is your user making progress or are, have they forgotten stuff since they used your system the time before? Direction really matters when we're talking about educational software, right? From one interaction to the next, is the user learning more things and progressing forward through the application? Or are they coming back and forgetting more things than they learned? And are they regressing in the lesson plan? How would they be able to see that in your, in your system? Is it possible to even reverse navigation? Right? So can I undo what I've done? Right? Or I can not only remember how to do three, but I don't even remember how to do the digit two. How do I back up in the system and go back to practicing digit two? How do you advertise that at this point in the system you can go forward or back, but at the moment you can't go forward until you do X? Right? How do you advertise that and what does it mean to go forward and back? That's, dis that's difference different from distance because now we're talking about geometry, right? Forward, back, left, right, up or down to these things, these things exist, right? Depending on the structure of your information space, navigation, some aspects of direction are easier, right? If you're working your way through a hierarchy, up is always clear, right? It's where you were before. Down is not always clear. You might not know what's below your current level of the hierarchy. Here's an example to try and concretize this idea. You open up a browser and you're on page A. Uh, there's a link that, that you click on that takes you to page B. You're now on page B and you hit the back button. What page are you going to see after you hit the back button? Page A, it's pretty obvious, right? So you're back on page A, you see another link, you click on that, it takes you to C. You're now on page C, you click back, you end up back on page A, which is obvious. And now you see that the forward button is possible. You click forward, which page do you go to? C. C. Did everyone know C? It's obvious, right? When I asked this question seven years ago, it was not obvious at all. The internet existed seven years ago. There were forward and back buttons and links. Why was that class split in their idea about whether the browser would take them to B or C, but you na hopefully now all unanimously would vote for C as where you'd go if you clicked forward? I was on A, I clicked and went to B, I clicked back, I came back to A, I clicked on another link, went to C, came back, I clicked the forward button, and it took me to C. Why? Yep. You have much more experience with the internet. Well, so you're not clicking forward on the link to C, you're just clicking on the forward button. You're not clicking so like, on the link for C. Like back when the internet was first created, people hadn't used it enough, like we probably experimented and done that before. Yeah. And we also understand that when you it's going to go forward to the previous page, that after you go back, the ah. track to B is lost. Uh, yes, right. So the track to B is somehow lost, right? When you click forward, you go to C. That wasn't true in all browsers seven years ago, right? There were other cases where it would take you somewhere else or would give you the choice of B or C. All browser developers have realized, again, an intuition about navigation. If I go forward and come back and go forward and come back and want to go forward again, most of the time I want to go forward to the most recently visited place. Right? That's just a universal assumption in all browsers. It wasn't seven, seven years ago. So there's this assumption now about the structure of browsers or, or navigating pages, right? It's just built, built in. Okay. 
Okay, uh, let's see here. So media, so we've, we've been talking mostly about the underlying conceptual structure of the space and trying to create perceptual objects that make navigation through that structure a little bit more, more obvious. So how can we exploit not just animation, not just uh, images, but sound and video and so on to help communicate the structure of an underlying information space? We only have two minutes left, so I'm not going to play this, this video. I'll just throw it out there as a question. We've drawn on, on the Leap Motion educational system as an example a number of times now. You kind of get a feel for where we're going in the weeks to come. How might you communicate with additional visualizations to your user the structure of the space and how to get about inside it? So think about the following. You might not have realized it yet, or you may have realized it by working with your Leap Motion device. It's a real pain in the butt to be doing something with a Leap Motion device and then go down and type something on the keyboard and come back, right? Because Leap Motion sees this, right? So 99% of the functionality of your users should allow them to communicate with the system without typing anything on the keyboard. I think they're going to type in their name at the beginning, and then everything else is done with one or two hands. One hand, the primary hand, is usually going to be for gestures. How might you use the secondary hand to allow the user to navigate through the space? And how might you visualize that on the screen? Do you mean like having a menu on the screen where you can actually use the hand you're not using to like Click, so Absolutely. So you could create a menu, right? And everyone knows kind of what a menu looks like. You don't have to write menu. It should be obvious. And maybe with the hand, they can move through that menu, right? How do I click on a menu button if I'm not touching the mouse? Sorry? I mean, get like somewhere close to it. <laughs> get somewhere close to it, but that's fine. What happens if I stroke my finger across the items in the hierarchy. How might you click on a button uh, in a leap motion space? You could have like a specific hand gesture that isn't like one of the digits. Exactly, right? So you now know how to get your system to recognize uh, gestures. Maybe you recognize this gesture, right? Or this gesture meaning go forward. Or this gesture meaning back it up. I want to go back. Or this meaning go left or go right. Does, your, does the structure of your educational system have three dimensions? Is there an up and a down, right? You could, ha you could recognize six gestures which re indicate that the user is trying to indicate they want to go forward, back, left, right, up, or, or down, right? That's, that functionality may be available in the system. How would you create a visualization to advertise that to, to the user? Okay, I think we've run out of time. You have a quiz due uh, tonight, and you have Deliverable 7 due next Wednesday evening. Have a good uh, weekend.